Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've just realized while I was sitting there that I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch today, so <laughs> I have some time on my hands. Um, thank you again to um, the organizers for inviting me. I must say, I got the invitation a month ago, and I was rather perplexed and shocked because I didn't know how um, I got this email. And I had a colleague in my office at the time, and she said to me, it's your big mouth, Nadine. It is your big mouth that got you there. But anyway, um, what I'll be speaking about um, is really my own experiences and what I've seen um, in my career as research. I've also engaged Wanga. We had a long discussion about what we would be talking about and how we would share uh, the speaking space. Um, and for a few days, I also started wondering, how did I get myself into this in the first place? My daily bread is alcohol and drugs, not literally, research. Um, but anyway, I've, I've had a major learning curve out of this because I've had to sit and really ponder and think about um, research in Africa. And one of the things, I mean, we're all familiar, or most of us would be with the old Likert scale. And if, on average, if you'd ask a researcher you know, do you consider research in Africa? And most of us would probably, you know, have our smiley face, you know, quite confidently chest out. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I got thinking about history, and um, Thomas also spoke about the history of, of research in Africa. And historically, um, we have generally been passive bystanders of, of research in Africa and in our own country. High-income countries over the years have just dictated um, research agendas in Africa, and that is by virtue of funding, and funding, unfortunately, is at the heart of all of this. International, inf international funding donors have been um, giving research to Africa um, quite generally, but um, I, I started thinking, have we been the principal um, recipients of these awards and not necessarily because it's often made, the awards are made to non-African um, institutions like your Harvard's or your Stanford's or all of these. And us Africans, um, scientists, we get the subcontract. So are we in control or are we not in control or what are we um, in this bigger situation? Over the years, and I've also seen it, there have been some self-serving research scientists coming into Africa with no genuine interest but this is where you have easy access to participants. I can tell you about communities the, that we have been involved in that's so poorly over-researched. I mean, they, they see us coming and they already know it's the MRC um, coming. And that's the extent um, to, to or, or that's what we've been dealing with. We have played key roles in these studies, not as a co-PI or PI for that matter, but do we walk away with the accolades? I mean, I, had the, I was fortunate um, when I was studying and doing my PhD that I got a fellowship, and there were a lot of African students that were part of this fellowship, and I actually felt I was one of the lucky ones because some of them had international supervisors who dominated not necessarily the actual work that went into the research study, but when it came to article writing and who gets a first author position and who gets the middle position, etc. So these are the realities that we are faced with. And sometimes when we think that we have considered Africa, it's really that we didn't, um, really in the true sense of the word. Um, I came across an article um, in The Scientist, and this is all the reading Copan I've been, do been doing in the last month. And um, the article was in The Scientist by a lady called Paula Parks. And she was speaking about the ongoing Ebola e epidemic in West Africa and was, you know, there's a lot of money being injected into Ebola research. But a question in this article was, what about funding for African science in general? And um, I thought this was interesting. And as I, you know, l read the article a little bit more, I found that there was a rebuttal from um, Francis Collins and Jeremy um, Farrow, which are associated with Wellcome Trust and NIH. And what they said was 
The proportion of awards made directly to African scientists and institutions is steadily increasing and now accounts for about 40% 40, 40 of Wellcome Trust and 63% of NIH funding for research in Africa. But what I read on was I found there was no elaboration on what percentage of various countries in Africa is, sorry, there's some, uh, I corrected that earlier, but I see it's still there. But we don't know what percentage is allocated to established researchers versus young upcoming researchers, because my experience um, in research is that there is a difference between being an, a, an established um, researcher versus a young upcoming being bushy-tailed, et cetera. We don't know how much of this goes to black African researchers, to women researchers, to research from historically disadvantaged um, institutions, or even um, researchers um, um, with disabilities. And, and Zuleika also spoke and alluded to this quite strongly when she gave um, some of the stats of what is really happening, which speaks directly to, to what is in this slide. So some of the challenges, some of are my own experiences, some are from people that I've spoken to uh, this last month, is that it's difficult for a young black researcher to make it in the science world, where the established researchers on average, the white male researcher, and Western models of research dominate. Um, we are expected as black African researchers to publish in English. And this is just uh, a given. Uh, if you are at Stellenbosch University, US, UCT, et cetera, your research thesis, um, your publications should be in English. And um, while someone that comes from a very advantaged background and was able to, to get the education um, in English, they can publish an article probably in two weeks when we are still struggling with our E's and R's. Um, Article and research proposal writing, obtaining grant funding, that is all in English. And of, of course, we also don't have the benefit of editors, which some countries sort of have. Um, publishing in high impact journals is just a pain. Um, it's a thorn in my side as well, because the journal system is not ideal. And I've been speaking to my um, supervisors and research because open access has become quite difficult. Um, and I mean, they are just question the idea of free publishing as an option for Africa, because in order to, for African researchers to gain credibility, um, we need to be out there. Um, we need to be publishing. And then, of course, these affiliations and true mentorship, which really lies close to my heart, is, is, is a true mentor should not really only be ticking a transformation box. And there's nothing that gets me more hot under the collar when I'm asked to say something. And my first question is, am I ticking a box? Because I don't like ticking a box. And in my life, I've had the fortune of having a really splendid PhD the supervisor who is actually in the audience and I, I was so surprised this morning when I saw Leslie London here because I didn't expect him but he has been awesome in my um, life as a PhD student. I graduated five years ago and I will still get emails today to say what about this, are you interested in this, here's a, a research thing. So um, that is just an accolade, he's not available, don't go running to him now. Okay? <laughs> Then, of course, um, and that was something that Kopano spoke about early in his, about mentorship and finding a really good mentor that is interested in developing you and not their own career. Um, mentorship and career growth, lack of career paths to attract and retain good researchers is a very serious impediment in South Africa in research institutions, in the MRC for that matter. And what I've seen is people just try and, you know, try and develop their, their own career sometimes with no uh, guidance. Then we have other barriers such as perpetual contracts which creates insecurity and, and stalls career development because how are you supposed to, as a young black African, um, you know, develop your career when you only have a six month contract and career development, it, you know, takes, takes time. And then, of course, I've also encountered, I've spoken to others, institutional ra racism. Um, some held in high esteem by virtue of their color, they progress like a bullet out of a gun, where um, some of us really struggle along and battle. Um, then, of course, um, there's something that I want to raise from another angle, 
Is this continuing and persistent exodus of highly trained African experts to the developed world? We are moving out in masses to the Europe's and the Americas. Um, the prevailing attitude, and when I was um, in my undergraduate, that was also my dream, oh, I'm going overseas. Um, because we, we perceived Harvard, and, or we perceive Harvard and Oxford to be better than UWC or uh, University of Pretoria or Walter C. Sulu because we think it's a superior uh, quality of nature. We think there's a lack of opportunity, and perhaps there is. Um, we want to broaden our horizons. We want to come back and contribute. But what they are studying there, we can also study here. And then it got me thinking to the blue bullet there. Do we as Africans also require a mind shift in ourselves? And I came across a lovely little um, piece from a Mandela Rhodes um, scholar who was considering, she writes in this article that she wanted to pursue a PhD and in her heart of heart she wanted to go to Oxford. And she, she said that she, she started reading and she started thinking and she realized that all of us who are serious about our transformation and decolonization have to stay. Going abroad and coming back should not be an option. And she qualifies this in a lovely way by looking at how the university, uh, how the world ranks universities globally. And they rank universities according to a whole lot of things, but what she particularly touches on this Zintle Manzini is teaching, research, and citations that in teaching at university, the more doctorates and the more MAs are awarded, the higher the university rating, which means the university gets rated globally as an established good university. Um, research get published under the, their department, some improve that which improves the um, university ratings. And of course, citations. You go overseas, you publish research there, who gets cited? The international world and not our very own Walter C. Sulu's. So how are we contributing in our mindset to um, perpetuating um, um, co colonialism in our own mind by, by what we think? And then, of course, I, I started reading because I, I just needed to know a little bit more about this, you know, alcohol and drugs is my scene. So um, I came across a, a phrase by David Dunn the world needs African researchers. He says we have a situation where 14% of the world's population living on a continent with a unique culture, diversity, and environment contributes less than 1% of published research output. And that in itself is profound. And then in 2014 and 2008, the one was in PLOS One and the other was in The Lancet, was really about strengthening research in Africa, improving the research environment, supporting individuals, and supporting research institutions. And one of the things, I mean, I can share the article with you because I'm sure Capano is going to let me know, I've got two minutes now, um, is that we need to support individuals. Um, we need to promote secondary and tertiary school-based science education. For the life of me, I don't see why an organization such as the MRC cannot match an organization, uh, organization perhaps like General Motors, who in the Eastern Cape went out and, and really invested in um, standard nine and, stand, and matric, uh, matriculants, um, identifying opportunities and giving them scholarships to go to university. I mean, here we're still a bit behind um, in relation to that. Um, we also need to um, find government and other African institutions, and I'm just highlighting a few, um, to invest in research. I mean, Zoleka made a beautiful point there. Is the MRC is a funder, so is the NRF. But where is the money coming from? It's still coming from international donors who set the scene around what they want research on. And if you look at the calls that come up, I mean, I regularly get calls for, for research. It's really still informed by what is happening in the outside or what is required um, by international funders. And um, this is really remarkable um, in that I, I saw a little phrase Knowledge from Afri Africa is equally persuasive as knowledge from Europe. No less 
and no more. And I think we need to embrace this as, as research scientists, as Africans. I try to look for it. There's um, Nelson Mandela, Mandela wrote his book, Long Walk to Freedom, and it's such a massive book, and I couldn't read it in two days again. But there's a, a section in it where he speaks about how he sometimes, when he was released from prison, he had to st step back and realize that he's a person of worth, that he has something to say, because the, the language and the, the words of the oppressor sometimes resonates with him to the point where he believed that he was lesser. And he had to constantly work at that. And for me in my life also, I've constantly had to, to work at certain things and really put myself out there, which is something I'll speak about later. We have also had developments in Africa, so it's also not bad. I mean, we know about our HIV vaccine initiatives and the first black, oh, there we go, one minute. But anyway, we need to strive to take the lead and to be an equal partner. We need to network, collaborate, stick our neck out. And that's what I've also tried to do. We can't be passive. Um, we need to work in Africa with local universities, with African universities, but we are very excited to work with Duke, which is our mindset that needs to change in the process. And then, of, of course, research translation. The last slide, um, we need programs um, funded by national institutions um, that allows incentives, ratings, and this is just my thought for researchers mentoring students from um, historically disadvantaged um, universities. We should be getting a, an incentive to encourage us to go and help these guys because in my own work I have seen amongst colleagues, oh no, you know that one doesn't write as fast. Of course we don't write as fast because we were never read in English or you understand what I'm saying. Um, politicians and policy makers need to consider how science and technology can contribute to development. African governments recognize that funds allocated for research are good investment. Um, and um, one of the colleagues spoke about budget allocations. That is real for, for, for African research and that we can't contribute to wealth um, creation. There's a lot of talent. The talent just needs to, and we all need to, to look and find and work towards developing. Thank you so much. In Corsi.